Hey, welcome to Gospel Community Sermon Podcast. Thanks for listening in. We hope that uh, you enjoy what you hear and that we handle the word faithfully. We'd invite you, if you have any questions or want to attend a service, to visit www.gcctroy.com. Recently, I've had a lot of conversations with um, those who are experiencing kind of this new faith, this new walk in grace. And as they describe this kind of experience, what they're describing is an old life of, of kind of a, a limitation or, or uh, just kind of a exterior-oriented faith and the new life of, of experiencing grace and understanding grace. And this former life was characterized by an external way of living. And they, they would say, you know, Christians in my day, they didn't do X. They didn't uh, watch those kinds of movies. They didn't do this kind of thing or that kind of thing. And many of us come from those kinds of traditions that we grew up underneath this kind of yoke of experience, of this work that we were to do to prove ourselves a part of the community of faith. But as they came to understand the gospel and the claims of Jesus, they understood the freedom of God's grace in Christ. That is, that unmerited favor, God's grace to us, right standing with God, was based upon performance no longer. It was not based upon the individual actions that I was supposed to do to show myself a part of the community. Now, grace by faith through Christ became the mantra of this belief. It stands to reason this morning, if grace is to be grace, if grace is to be gracious, the grace that's described in the New Testament, it is scandalously so. If Ephesians chapter 2 is correct, and it says that by, by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing, there's no work to be conformed or performed this morning that we can bring ourselves into good graces with a righteous and holy God. See, our salvation is by grace, through faith, like Paul says, not as a result of works. In other words, our faith is as it stands before God, nothing more and nothing less. Nothing anyone thinks about my faith outside of God himself and Christ matters. This morning, in our time in John, we're invited to this understanding. And we're inviting into into it as a, a miraculous sign is performed, where Jesus turns water into wine. He fundamentally changes the substance of something so that what it was before has now become something completely different. As we look at this miracle, I think we're going to see this, that Jesus fulfilled the old era, the old era of the law, the old era of doing and performing and and acting before God, and he's brought us into this new era of grace. It's not to say, and I want to just kind of put a pin in this idea, that the old era was not of grace. If we look back in John chapter 1, we see that God has given us grace upon grace, and we saw that that meant grace instead of grace, that there was a grace in the law that is leading us into a new grace in Christ. We want to kind of unpack that a little bit as John kind of gives us this introduction to who Jesus is. He invites us into this new season in John chapter 2 through 4, and he's going to introduce this with this miraculous sign. So Jesus fulfilled the old era to bring us the new era of grace. See, as we've studied this book so far, we see that John's broken up this book for us. In John chapter 1, we had an introduction. In John chapters 2 through 11, we have this book of signs, and that's broken into three different parts. This morning, we, st- we kind of step into the first of those three different parts, into the, uh, the Cana cycle, where these different miracles are going to be performed first in Cana, and then in Jerusalem, and then we'll kind of return back to Cana by the end of John chapter 4. And so there's this kind of cycle that's happening where Jesus is kind of introducing himself to the world, as it were. 
when we get to John chapter 5, it'll introduce this new kind of feast cycle where all these different feasts and festivals will happen, and Jesus will be performing miracles and signs throughout that time through John chapter 5 through John chapter 10. And then when we get to John chapter 11, we'll see the Lazarus cycle to tell us one miracle and all of the responses that happen in John chapters 11 and 12. So we enter into this new phase here in John chapter 2, and I invite you to turn with me in John chapter 2 that we can kind of understand John's intention. Look with me at the first of our uh, points here this morning in John chapter 2 verses 1 through 5, where Mary, the mother of Jesus, pushes Jesus into an action. Look at chapter 2 verse 1. On the third day there was a wedding in, at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was, de- was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, there are, they have no wine. Excuse me. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Kind of an interesting interaction here between Jesus and his mother, and we want to kind of dig into that. But first, John invites us in these first two verses to see the characters that are here on the scene in this wedding. John tells us the the kind of guest list that were there, right? Uh, In fact, uh, he kind of invites us to see that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there, Uh, that notice he doesn't even name who she is, not to cause confusion with Mary's later uh, mentioned in chapters 12 and chapter 11. But we see that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. We also see that Jesus himself was invited in verse 2, and his disciples were invited. All of this is kind of under the heading of of this kind of wedding that's going on. And we're saying, okay, what's going on with this wedding? Well, John invites us into this problem in verse 3. Look at verse 3. He says, when the wine ran out, they had run out of wine, right? That's problematic. Why is that problematic? Because these people are just luscious. They just need so much alcohol that the wine had run out. This was a serious problem. Well, actually, this is a reflection on their social standing. See, what would happen in these weddings is they would be multiple day affairs, and sometimes they would go on for a week. So you have this party that's just going on and on and on, and sometimes uh, they would run out of wine. Specifically, the groom himself was responsible to kind of provide the wine for this celebration. And so if he ran out of wine, it was a big time like social faux pas. It would have brought shame to them in this very shame-oriented culture. And so Mary's concern in verse 3 is fitting. That's what she brings up. They have no wine, she says to Jesus. And what happens in verses 4 and 5 is John shows us this conflict that's happening. See, Mary pushes as Jesus's mom in verse 4. Look, or verse 3, that's, that's what she's saying. They have no wine. And Jesus responds and says, woman, what does that have to do with me? It's hard to tell exactly what Mary's intentions are in verse 3. She seems to want Jesus to do something about this problem, right? He's saying, they have no wine, Jesus. What are you going to do about it? We have good reason to think that here in this stage of Jesus' life that his father was no longer living. The last time we saw Joseph mentioned was in Luke chapter 2. Jesus was 12 years old. He kind of slipped away and went to the temple without his parents knowing. Take heart, parents. If you've ever messed up, Jesus' parents left him in Jerusalem for two days or something, right? And he still didn't get too screwed up, right? So we haven't seen Jesus' father on the scene for some time. In fact, in Mark chapter 6, we have this description of Jesus as a carpenter. It seems like Jesus kind of took over the family business. And so Mary's there interacting with Jesus as if he's the problem solver of the family. She's turning to him saying, Jesus, they have no wine. Why don't you do something about it? You know, occasionally I'll get a phone call from my parents, and it's a discussion about some technological problem they have, right? I don't know the Wi-Fi password at my house. I don't know the Wi-Fi password at your house either, right? I don't know if this phone can get me to surf the interwebs, as they say it, right? See, sometimes our children become a natural kind of problem solver for us. So it's highly possible that Mary isn't anticipating a miracle, or maybe she is, we don't really know, but she's looking to Jesus to solve this issue like a mom looks to her son. But Jesus seems to interpret her request differently in verse 4. Look at what he says in verse 4. 
it, it almost seems so sharp the way he says it. He says, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. You almost get a little tense. Like there's a, a, an awkward interaction happening here between Jesus, the perfect son of God, and his earthly mother. We feel this tension kind of there. First of all, before we get too far down this road, we recognize that Jesus fully fulfilled the, the fifth commandment, right? He honored his earthly father and his earthly mother in such a way to fulfill all righteousness that when he laid himself down as a sacrifice, that he actually covered over our unrighteousness, our dishonor to our mothers and our fathers. So Jesus is not dishonoring his mother. We can just kind of take that off of the scene here this morning. So what is the nature of this statement? See, when Jesus says to him, woman, we think of a 21st century interaction, right? Woman? It's not how Jesus is speaking. See, while this title might have been distancing for Jesus, it wasn't disrespectful. And so Jesus is interacting with his mother in a respectful way, but saying, you and I are at odds here. And he goes on and explains exactly why this is. He says, what does this have to do with me? Literally, what to me and to you? See, Jesus is using this idiomatic phrase, and you're saying, what the heck is an idiomatic phrase? An idiom is things that we use that are like common everyday uh, slurs and language that we use. We say things like beat around the bush or bite the bullet. They don't make any sense when you actually like look at the words and what they mean, but we all know what they mean. And so Jesus is using this idiomatic phrase as if to say, this is not my problem. This is not our problem. Woman, this has nothing to do with us. And he presses on, and Jesus shows us exactly what he's thinking. He says, my hour has not yet come. What's Jesus saying here? See, throughout the book of John, John is using this phrase, the hour, always to refer to the hour of Jesus' death. We see this in, in John chapter 12 and John chapter 17. We see instances or, or uh, places like this in 7 and 8 and chapter 13. So for him to say that his hour had not yet come, Jesus is recognizing the potentiality that this miracle, this thing he's about to do, would propel him closer to the day of his death. See, ironically, John shows us that doing miraculous good to others leads to the worst kind of rejection in this society. And look what happens next. See, Mary sub submits to Jesus' directive, not as a mother, but as, as to her Lord. And so Mary calls for the servants in verse 5, and she tells them to do whatever he, Jesus, tells them to do. Notice she entrusts the whole situation to Jesus. She no longer insinuates what should happen. She sim simply lets him handle it. Carson, D.A. Carson, the commentator on this passage, says that, that Mary has a mother-son interaction in verse 3, but a worshiper-savior interaction in verse 5. See, the, the playing field has changed. Jesus has redirected Mary's thinking so that now she's submitted to his plan and to his purpose. See, all of this, as we step back, we recognize that as God is in, in, ushering in a new era, he still calls us to acts of righteousness. He still calls us to holiness. He still calls us to obey his, his command and his design. We still are the created things that are submitting to our creator, aren't we? Even in this era of grace, we still have this responsibility to live out righteousness, to submit ourselves to the designs and the desires of our holy, righteous Savior, Jesus Christ. See, in the former things, it used to be that God related to you on the basis of your obedience. In Deuteronomy 11, we see this. We see that, that Moses says to the people of God, see, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. If you obey, you are blessed. If you disobey, you are to be cursed. And so Moses is setting before them this obedience or disobedience to set the, the trajectory of their existence. And it's interesting to note that Jesus here anticipates that Mary will submit to him. His own earthly mother will submit to his own desire and design. 
for us here this morning. It reminds us that we ourselves, even in an era of grace, are still bound to the righteous designs of our Savior. We do not escape our moral requirement before God. Amen? Even as we talk about freedom in Christ, you and I are not free to do as we wish, as we will, as we want. Some of us may need to learn this anew. That as free and as scandalous as grace is, it never sets us free to do just the inclinations of our own heart. In fact, what it designs to do is to change the heart, to rip out the heart of stone, to replace it with a heart of flesh, to change our desires so that we become more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. Recently heard of a, of a man who claims to be in Christ, who claims to be a part of a church that was asking his wife for an open relationship. And you're saying those two things cannot be. We cannot be living in open sexual sin and also claiming to be new in Christ. Those two things are naturally in contradiction to one another. See, as free as grace is, it doesn't negate the responsibility we have before a righteous and holy God to do the things he's asked. We should love obedience to God as we are changed by the gospel of grace. And so Mary is invited to submit, submit herself, excuse me, to the lordship of her own son, Jesus Christ. Well, the second phrase that we get into is in verses 6 through 11, we see this miraculous thing performed. Jesus solves this problem with a miracle. Jesus invites his disciples. He invites his own mother. He invites these, uh, these waiters that are there to see his own sovereignty over substances, whether it be water or whatever else it is. And so look with me at verses 6 through 11 that Ryan has read for us this morning. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. What's, what's happening here? See, Jesus enacts this plan, and he finds these six stone water jars in verse 6. And, and notice the purpose of these. This, this is important, that these were for the rites of purification. That was this ritual hand washing so prevalent in this day. Uh, the Old Testament kind of prescribed that priests would have to wash their hands while they were making sacrifices in the temple. And in the modern era, in the first century, these Pharisees had kind of taken scene fit to take that ritual of hand washing and push it not just in the temple but throughout all of Israel and if they did that they recognized or they thought that God himself would kind of reorient himself amongst the Israelites that if people were pure and clean then God would come and live amongst them again so Carson says that these jars were were likely used for ceremonial cleansing they were used to clean utensils or hands or whatever else it was and so these six stone jars holding about 100 to 150 gallons of water, Jesus calls for them to be filled. Now, imagine being the guy that has to fill the six stone jars with 150 gallons of water running back and forth with a pail, right? Like a little cup back and forth three million times. But this is what Jesus demands. And when it's all finished in verse 8, Jesus asks them to get one more bucket of water from uh, the well, and take it to the headmaster. See, we might say, oh, wait, wait a minute. No, what he's doing is he's dipping into those jars of purification, and he's taking that to the headmaster, and then these six stone jars are actually becoming wine. That's what's happening here. That's the miracle that's being performed. But I think the text actually indicates something different, and Carson kind of brought this out in his commentary. He's saying it's not just that these six, six stone jars were filled. It's that they were filled to the brim. 
And then Jesus told them to go back and dip again into the well, that that is where this water is coming from, not from these six stone jars. That's important. Put that on the shelf for just a second. The head waiter returns, and he finds this water now made wine. But it's not just this garbage wine. Look at the headmaster's words, verse 10. Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Now, notice what the concern was to begin with was that this bridegroom would be showing poorly, that he would run out of wine, that he would be disgraced because of this. But now it becomes a point of emphasis of his abundance, that he saved the best wine until the very last. See, what happened was like you would bring in your guests and they would have everything to drink at first. And when they were no longer tasting as well, when they had a little too much to drink, that's when you brought out the natty light, right? That's when you brought out the cheap stuff. And so you would fill them up with the cheap stuff when they had too much to drink already. But Jesus, because of his miraculous sign that he's performing here, invites them to taste the good wine last. See, this groom seems to have waited until the end to bring out the good stuff, as it were. And we'll see exactly what this meaning is here in a second. John interprets this miracle for us in verse 11. Look at what he says there. He says, this is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. See, what John is telling us is that Jesus was performing his first miraculous sign. Remember, there's seven signs to be performed here. This is the first of those seven signs. And we'll kind of dig out those signs as we go through the text. But John is cluing us in here to say this is the arche. This is the first, the primary sign of Jesus's Messiahship. And he's telling us even beyond that, that Jesus was manifesting his glory. By this sign that Jesus performed, he's showing us his true state to the world. It's not to say that his disciples didn't believe in him before, that he wasn't showing them that he was Messiah. Surely, as we look back at John chapter 1, Jesus has an understanding that he was Messiah before this, but he's inviting his disciples to this new level of belief, and that's exactly what the outcome is there in verse 11. He manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. See, we all need to step back for this in just a second and for just a second, just kind of look exactly what John is trying to show us. After all, this is Jesus' first sign. Notice that John uses the word sign rather than miracle. And as we look at the other Gospels, we see in Matthew and Mark and Luke, uh, those authors use the, the miracles that Jesus performed almost as a validation of who he was. Jesus would walk on water, and his disciples would believe in him. Jesus would cast out a demon. And so uh, these disciples would come to know something just very basic about him, that he was uh, sovereign over nature, that he was sovereign over demons, that he was sovereign over disease, that he uh, had control of these things. But the way John uses these signs, he, he uses them differently. See, John treats these miracles as lessons in themselves. They become allegories of Jesus' spiritual significance. When we get to John chapter 9, Jesus is going to heal a man born blind. And partway through the conversation about what happened, this man born blind is going to say this. He says, this I know, I once was blind, but now I see. And John's going to use this issue of blindness to go on to describe the Pharisees in John chapter 10. In John chapter 11, we're going to see that a dead man is raised to life in Lazarus, and Jesus is going to use that moment to Mary and Martha, and he's going to say, I am the resurrection and the life. He's not just talking about he has power to do these things. He's actually using them as allegories to tell them about the miraculous healing work, the grace that he's going to bring to the world. So how do we understand this miracle? How do we understand what Jesus is accomplishing here? See, when, whenever we're looking for this kind of significance in the Scriptures, we got to be willing to say only what the Scriptures themselves lead us to say. 
And so I want to draw your attention to a few details in this passage. In verses 6 through 9, we see the word water used four times. And the author goes to great detail to describe that these stone jars were filled up to the brim. He's inviting us to this reflection about these stone jars and what's happening in those stone jars. Also, the waiter's words kind of draw us to understand exactly what's happening in this passage. He said, you have kept the good wine until now. And all of this shows us that Jesus is something different than those big stone jars of purification. In in fact, those uh, have been filled to the brim. The time of purification and the law is done. It has been filled. It is filled to the brim. It's done. It's over with. But now, in verse 10, the moment of the good wine is here in Christ. Jesus has ushered in something new for us. See, throughout the Old Testament, wine was a sign of the superabundance of God's kingdom. And we could take you to all kinds of passages to kind of prove this. There's Jeremiah 31 and Hosea 14. But I want to draw us to Amos chapter 9. I just want to give an instance of when this happens. In Amos chapter 9, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, wine, him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, wine, and drink their wine. And they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. The Baptists are highly uncomfortable with this passage. I had to take that little shot, right? Jesus is this good wine. It's been stored until now. Those six stone jars are filled up to the brim. And now the good wine is here. The celebration is commenced because Christ has come. See, by this sign, Jesus is telling us he is the arrival of the season of blessing. The old season of law, symbolized by these six stone jars, has been filled up. We no longer relate to God through a complex series of laws and rituals. Our acceptance is no longer based upon our performance. Now, in Christ, we come to God through his promised Son. And our acceptance is based upon our faith in his Christ. That's good news. See, Jesus now brings the blessing of God to the people of God. It's as if Jesus kind of came down the mountain, so to speak, to bring his blessing and his abundance to his people. If you know anything about the Old Testament, you know that the law was limited. Jesus, Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 3 about the limitations of the law. And I'm going to invite us to see Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. For all who rely on works of the law are under a what? A curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now, it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. If you wanted to live by the law, law, if you wanted to be righteous by the law, you had to do all of it. You had to do everything. You had to keep the rites of purification. You had to shave the the corners of your beard or not trade, shave the corners of your beard. I, I don't even remember what you do with your beard in the Old Testament. You had to eat the perfectly clean and holy things that were assigned that could be eaten, and you had to stay away from the unclean things that couldn't be eaten. And you had to perform all of these moral understandings of these laws that were given from Moses. See, those who seek to be right with God by law are cursed, according to what Paul says here. Those old stone jars don't bring you wine. Notice Paul's quote in verse 10. Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. Every jot and tittle of the law had to be followed if you were to be righteous. This week I was 
we've been doing this class in our growth modules, and it's on the holiness of God. And Sproul kind of took a, a time out to discuss Martin Luther. Martin Luther was uh, one who was trained as a lawyer in Germany. He was raised under Roman Catholicism, and he was there trying to work his righteousness. And he was passing through a field one day, and a storm settled in, and he called out to his uh, patron saint, Anne, and he said, Anne, I will become a monk if you save my life. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. He lived, he entered into the monastery, but he was so focused upon his own sinfulness. He would go to the confession. He would spend hours in the confessional confessing and confessing all of the things that he had done wrong. He was so uh, peculiar, so uh, intent upon the, the individual sins that he had created that he would confess for hours and hours, wearing out the priest that he was confessing to. And he would get out of the confessional and immediately remember the things that he had not confessed. He could be heard in his room in the monastery at night. So he would be shouting at the devil, as it were, who was accusing him of all of his unrighteousness and all of his sinfulness. See, what happens is that Luther had this blatant understanding of his violations of the righteous law of God that he could not add up. One time, one of his priests said to him, Spalatin said to him, Martin, just love God. Don't worry about all these little peccadilloes. Don't worry about all these little sins, all these little infractions against, against God. Just love God. And Luther scoffs in response and says, love God? I hate God. God just brings condemnation to me. Until... He discovered Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And he goes on to say that the righteous shall live by faith. And he recognizes that it's not his righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ. That's what Paul goes on to say in Galatians chapter 3. Look at verses 13 through 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Paul's telling us that Christ became the curse for us. By his substitutionary death, Jesus gives us the good wine of his righteousness. He's taken our curse upon himself. He has bestowed the blessing of his right of inheritance upon us. Some 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, the rightful Son of God, was taken outside the city of Jerusalem, and there he, in all of his righteousness, was stripped naked, nailed to a cross, died like a criminal, all of this so that he might bear my unrighteousness and the unrighteousness of all of those who place faith upon him. See, so that, as Paul says here in Galatians 3, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, the blessing from God himself has come to us. See, as Jesus died the death we deserved, we have been given the life which he earned. And that's the good wine which God has waited to give us. And there's no stone jar religion that can replace it. This morning, what happens is that many of us seek to celebrate Jesus' new life with old stone jar rites of purification. Ever find yourself doing this? You're saying, what on earth do you mean? See, you and I, we might not be given to ritual hand washing. We might not be given to um, ritual sacrifice or any of the Old Testament laws. But there is a law of our new era, isn't there? Maybe you're like me. See, this is my tendency, right? I tend to get to a Sunday like this, and I take an account of all of the sins that I've performed that I'm aware of. And I start to kind of weigh whether my week was good or bad. Or maybe you do this. Maybe you're one who, who counts up your time in the Word or time in prayer. And you kind of accumulate it and you let that be your righteous standing before God. 
We make sure that we look, act, and speak like a Christian. We put on our external righteousness for others. And all of these things are externally based. They're designed to show others our righteousness. They're hand-washing and phylacteries of the 21st century. This orientation kind of comes out in a couple different ways. Maybe you're here and you're a parent. So can I just, I'll have a moment of confession here as a parent. Sometimes what I do is a child will do something that's obviously wrong. They've broken the rules, as it were. And what I tend to do is I tend to hold myself aloof to make them feel the weight of what they've done wrong. And you stop and say, is that a gospel orientation? Are you one who withholds your affection from a disobedient child even after they've owned up to their wrong? Sometimes what happens is the child comes to us and they're, they're broken, they're contrite, and they know that they've done something wrong. They, they're working through it. And we, sometimes I will hold myself aloof to make sure they feel the wrong of that moment. You ever do that? What kind of gospel does that display? Forgiveness from God is given when we confess and there's sufficient amount of suffering procured. That's the gospel we're preaching. If you confess and you suffer long enough, then you'll be in my good graces. Or maybe we do this when we hear of other sins. We hear that they have performed some wrong and we step away and say, that's disgusting. How dare they? How dare they do that thing? I would never do such a thing. We kind of stick our chests out in self-righteousness. Maybe you watch the news and a headline comes across about the newest sin, public sin of so-and-so and such-and-such. And And we just stand in condemnation. That's wrong. How could they do such a thing? And we forget all of the atrocities that we ourselves have brought to the lap of God. We forget all of the things that we have been forgiven, the grace that's been extended to us in the cross of Jesus Christ, that through faith we're saved, not by my individual works. See, sometimes we preach a gospel that we don't live out. So the truth is this morning that Christian, you and I are only accepted to God by faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't that the truth? We're only acceptable to God by faith in Jesus Christ, that by placing my faith upon the sacrifice of Jesus and having that hope alone for my eternity, for my present, and for my past, that's the only means by which I stand justified or announced righteous before the throne of God. See, when we sin, we're only acceptable to God by faith in Christ. When we succeed, we're only acceptable to God by faith in Jesus Christ. When we go to church, we're only acceptable to God by faith in Jesus Christ. When we don't go to church, we're only acceptable to God by faith in Jesus Christ. When we share our faith with our neighbor, we're only acceptable to God by faith in Jesus Christ. When we blow our testimony before our neighbor, we're only acceptable to God by faith in Jesus Christ. In the morning, we're only acceptable to God by faith in Jesus Christ. In the evening, we're only acceptable to God by faith in Jesus Christ. When we pray, we're only acceptable to God by faith in Jesus Christ. And when we don't pray, we're only acceptable to God by faith in Jesus Christ. See, no matter what you do, standing, sitting, lying down, breathing, not breathing, whatever it is, you're only acceptable to God by faith in Jesus Christ. It is scandalous grace. No matter what your history is or what your future holds, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you will be in the presence of God for eternity. Isn't that freeing this morning? He has brought the new wine of Jesus to us. Because the stone jars have been filled. If you are acceptable before God, it has nothing to do with you, and it has everything to do with this Messiah, Jesus. I wonder if you might be here this morning, and that message needs to sink from your head into your heart, or from your heart into your hands. 
I wonder if we're here this morning and we know the truths of the gospel, but we fail to live out the reality of the gospel. I want to pray this morning that God allows us to be a people of grace, a people who taste this new wine in Christ, who enter into this life of celebration because we know those old jars of the law have been filled. Lord, we pray that this morning that you would allow us to be a people of rich, abundant grace before you. Lord, immerse us into this understanding of your goodness and mercy in Christ. Strip of us of this desire to live out righteousness, to seek glory from others. But allow us, Lord, standing before you that trusts in the work of Jesus alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.